Genesis 40. Genesis chapter 40. Father, we settle our hearts. We thank you for your word. And we pray now as we continue and we study Joseph. Sitting in prison, falsely accused. Wondering if you've forgotten all about him. And yet you're still working. Lord, I'm sure there are people sitting here in the room in the congregation who have wondered if you've forgotten all about them. It feels like things in their lives are never going to change. They're wondering if you love them. I pray your word would be a great encouragement to each person in the room today. That you love us, Lord. You have a plan. Even when we didn't know you, you were faithful, Lord, to call us. As we studied on Wednesday night, before the world was formed, you knew us. Truly amazing. Be with us now, Lord. May your word touch every heart in the room. And we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, your scripture would be alive to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a little reminder, chapter 39, let's pick it up in verse... 11, it came to pass at this time that Joseph went into the house to do his work, his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And Potiphar's wife caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, and he fled, and he got him out. And it came to pass that when he saw, she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, and that he was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house, and spake unto them, saying, See how he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us? He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass that when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until her, his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to those words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. And if we remember from last week, Psalm 105 says that he was, he was injured or he was harmed with iron as they put the collar and the fetters on him. And I can't help but wonder, I don't know about you, if you're Potiphar, right, and you're in charge of Pharaoh's security and you can handle his political prisoners. I have a feeling Potiphar probably knows a thing or two about interrogation and torture. It's the hunch. I'd be willing to bet that perhaps some of the things that Joseph endured might have even been torture. We won't know until we get to heaven. We get to see him with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But wouldn't it be interesting if he had been interrogated and Potiphar found that his story was true, that he had done nothing? That would put Potiphar in a pretty tight bind, wouldn't it? But something happened, because Joseph there, sitting in prison, the Lord was with him, verse 21, and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison, who works for Potiphar, obviously, committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners and that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. It's all under Joseph's hand. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with Joseph. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And so now, chapter 40, it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt had offended, and the baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Now, look, when you hear butler, you're thinking lurch, right? <laughs> That's not the idea. Some examples, uh, Nehemiah, I mean, book of Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah was a butler. He was a cup bearer. This is one who is involved basically with bringing drink to the king, in this case Pharaoh, which is the title of king. And it's actually a very important position. The historians tell us, well, some tried to say originally that you know, the, the Egyptians don't use wine and everything else. That was Herodotus. Uh, turns out he was wrong as they did more excavation. The more the archaeologists worked things over, they realized not only did the Egyptians use wine, but it was a daily part of their lives. No mystery there. 
But his job is to probably be over the vineyards, most likely over the cellars, over everything that would do with producing drink for the king, for Pharaoh. It becomes an important position. Some say he might have had as many as 100 people under him because he, if someone wants to try and bump the king off, one great way to do it is poison him. And so his job is to make sure that everything that comes to Pharaoh will not harm him in any way. And, by the way, as he sits there passing the time, as Pharaoh's enjoying a cup of whatever, there they, they talk, whatever. And so if you can bend the cupbearer, or the butler's ear, you can get into Pharaoh. And so if you think about our mod modern political arena of lobbyists, right, you can lobby, for example, the butler and suddenly come to the attention of Pharaoh. Very important position. So much so that Nehemiah is able to leave for long seasons and go be the governor of Jerusalem and restore and rebuild the walls. How many remember Hezekiah, that king? Remember when the Assyrians surrounded the city of Jerusalem there and they had attacked the north already and Hezekiah is, you know, stressed and what are we going to do? And Isaiah the prophet comes out and says, look, they're not even going to fire an arrow against the city. I'm going to handle it. Shennacherib sent a guy named Rabshakeh. Rabshakeh there was blaspheming the name of the Lord and talking about how God was going to wipe them out and Rabshakeh's title means cupbearer. So here's a guy who's in charge of Shennacherib's army and delivering messages, and he's a cupbearer. They're very influential. And if you know the rest of the story, the angel of the Lord went out that night, killed 185,000 Assyrians, which basically took out their ability to fight. Shennacherib went home in humiliation. So it's an important position, cupbearer. Came to pass after these things that the butler, the cupbearer, the king of Egypt, and his baker, the baker, again, important position, controlling food, make sure they don't get poisoned. They had, according to historians, 38 varieties of cake. You know, when you think pyramids, you think like guys dragging stones around. You don't think 38 varieties of cake, do you? That just doesn't register for me. I'm, they had 57 kinds of bread. And this guy's job is to get the food to Pharaoh and, again, make sure he's not poisoned. And if you think like, oh, what's the big deal? I knew somebody who worked on a military ship back during President Bush the first. He was a cook. He was in the galley. When Bush visited that military ship, everything was brought with him, from water to food to it. Nothing was taken from a, our own military ship. Everything traveling with the president that he would need was with him and provided by his entourage. So they still do things like this. But anyway came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Something happened that has caused them to be at risk, apparently some attempt against Pharaoh or some rumored attempt or something. But Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. Now, go back to chapter 39 for a minute. Look at verse 19. When Potiphar heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him after this manner, this did your servant do to me. His wrath was kindled. But remember, it didn't say against who? Now, yeah, we think Joseph, but it doesn't say against Joseph. Maybe he knew his wife too well. Now we get into chapter 40. Pharaoh, when we find out he's upset, we're told against whom? His butler and his baker, the chief of them. And so he put them inward in the house of the captain of the guard. Who's the captain of the guard? Potiphar, chapter 39, verse 1, which means the compound of Potiphar's house most likely had the prison somewhere on that same area. And so when Joseph goes to jail, he goes to jail probably on the same property compound that he had managed for Potiphar. And if he's interrogated, and if Potiphar believes he didn't do anything, why not let him out? Anybody want to guess? If he's innocent... What does that mean? His wife's a god. Yeah, exactly. So, sorry, Joseph. You just got to stay on ice here. And sorry, buddy. So he put him into the ward of the house of the captain of the guard, into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. And they continued a season, yamen, days, a number of days inward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them. Each man his dream in one night. Joseph is suddenly going to be confronted with two dreams. Does that ring any bells? How many did Joseph have? Two dreams. He 
Dream to dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. I don't know about you, but if I was stuck in prison for some attempt against Pharaoh, I don't think I'd be happy any day that I was in there personally, but somehow they're more sad than they were. And so he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, that would be Potiphar's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sad? Come on, fellas, what's wrong? Yeah, it's morning. How, why are you guys so sad? Um, we're in jail. <laughs> Come on, just, there's some humor here. Why are you guys looking so sad today? They said to him, We've dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. You see, if they had free access to their usual positions, they could just go over to Pharaoh's magician, magi, as they would be called, or his wise men, and say, all right, I had this really creepy dream. This is what happened. What do you think? And they'd break out their books, and they would interpret it to them. There's a whole discipline, much like what Daniel experienced there with Nebuchadnezzar and else, others. There's this whole discipline for divining and interpreting dreams with occult power. But since they're in the tank, they can't talk to those guys. So they have these dreams, and they can't talk to the usual advisors. They're stuck. We've dreamed a dream. There's no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. So was just, here's a vine. And apparently, as he's watching it, in the vine, there were three branches. And it was as though it budded. So as I'm watching these three branches, little buds start popping out on it. And her blossom shot forth. So then as the buds came forward, they blossomed. And then the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. So he's just he's standing there in three branches, and this thing's happening in front of him. And as it brings forth ripe grapes, I looked, and I had Pharaoh's cup in my hand. And so I reached out and took the grapes, and I crushed them into the cup, and then I handed the cup to Pharaoh. And then I awoke. Weird, huh? In the vine, there were three branches. Notice the repeating of three. As though it budded, blossomed, shot forth grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I pressed it, and I handed it. And I handed it into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee. I wonder what his reaction was. Like, think about this. Two guys have dreams. Two guys are in trouble for the same thing. One of them is willing to tell his dream right away. Does that give you any hint? If you haven't done anything wrong, you're not usually too worried, are you, about stuff? Three days Pharaoh shall lift up your head and restore you unto your place, and you shall deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. And then Joseph says, but think on me. Don't forget me when it shall be well with you. And show kindness, I pray, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house, for I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. Was he? Well, I mean, what really happened? He was rejected by his own brothers and sold into slavery. Does that sound at all familiar? Jesus came to his own, his own received him not, right? They paid Judas 30 pieces of silver, price of a slave. Why didn't he say, I was sold by my rat brothers to some Midianites who brought me down and sold me as a slave. Why didn't he say that? Perhaps because of the humiliation. His own family turned against him. But for some reason, it's true, I mean, he was shanghaied out basically and sold, but he leaves out that it was through his hands of his own brothers. Hey, think on me when you get out of here. Show kindness to me. Mention me to Pharaoh. That's called lobbying. That's what cupbearers can do for you. It's a good position. Mention me to Pharaoh, get me out of this house, for indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I've done nothing that they should put me into this dungeon. 
Dear Mr. Butler, having been falsely accused, you can understand my pain. Get me out of here. Well, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, let me translate, the coast is clear. He said unto Joseph, I, I, I also was in my dream. And behold, I had three white baskets on my head. Herodotus tells us that the Greek men, or sorry, the Egyptian men carry things on their head and the women carry things on their shoulders. So that shows it's accurate. That's what they do in Egypt. I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. Again, 38 varieties of cake, 57 of bread. All manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the baskets upon my head. Hmm. What's the difference in this dream? What's missing? It's for Pharaoh, but he doesn't get them to Pharaoh. Catch that little difference? Interesting. Now, we got a couple things we have to consider here. First one is something called expositional constancy. <laughs> what does that mean? It means keep it the same. When you go through Scripture and you see something, if it's interpreted for us elsewhere, we should apply that, keep the same rule. And so when these birds are showing up, that should remind us, hey, remember the parable of the sower? Remember that Jesus said, a man went out sowing the seed, some seed fell on the, on the path and the birds of the air came and snatched it away. Some seed fell on the shallow ground and it sprung up and it immediately came up. When the heat of the sun came up, it withered. Some seed fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it, bore no fruit. And some seed fell on the good soil and some brought forth 30 and 60 and 100 fold. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples said, what does that mean? And so Jesus said, the seed is the word of God. That God sent his son to die for us, rose again the third day. And if you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you will accept that, God will begin to work in you. Your life will change. You'll grow. Those that hear that Jesus died for them and yet refuse to accept it, before they even get a chance, like that hard road, the devil comes and snatches the seed away. Ah. So the birds are a type of demonic activity or wickedness or evil, right? That's what Jesus told us when he interpreted. Those that fell among the shallow ground are those who hear the gospel and go, wow, that's great, he'll forgive me? Wait a minute, I have to change? I don't want to do that. And when the heat of the day of really believing and living out what you say you want to receive, when that heat comes on, they wither, that's it. Those that fall among the thorns are those who hear the gospel, but the cares of this life choke it, and there's no fruit. And listen, Philadelphia fans, when I say choke, you know what that means. We get nothing. <laughs> but those who hear the gospel, who understand Jesus died for them, receive that in their heart by faith and keep it, as he said in Luke's gospel. They bring forth fruit for God, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Interesting, even there, a difference. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he goes to the parable of the mustard seed there in Matthew 13 about kingdom of heaven's like a mustard seed, tiny seed, but when it goes in the ground, it grows up and becomes a, a great plant, and so much so that the birds lodge in the branches. And so let's take that again. The church is going to start small. It's become a, going to become huge. And some branches of the church, Satan is going to infiltrate. Does that fit? Well, yeah, turn on the news. So... When this guy is telling us that birds are eating out of the baskets, is that a good thing based on what we've been studying? No. No, let's go back to it. So, I had three baskets on my head. Three white ones. In the uppermost basket, there was all manner, verse 17, of baked meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the baskets upon my head. There are Egyptian monuments that actually illustrate this idea. The cooks would carry the food on baskets. They'd go from the kitchen, cross the courtyard to the king, the pharaoh. And because they, you know, revered the falcon and other birds, they worshipped them, they didn't, they, they had, you know, basically they're environmentally protected. How's that for a modern term? So these things are all over, and the birds know where to find the food. And so there was constant problem where birds would try to take food as they're bringing it from the kitchen to the king. If you've ever been to, like, Ocean City... You know, you understand this problem? One time, my wife and I were out. I had a little ice cream. This bird goes, boom, boom, boom. I got a wing to the head. I look up, and the, and the ice cream's gone. I got cone. <laughs> Nothing but cone. Like, <laughs> and it's flying away. It was laughing. I could hear it. <laughs> I was so bummed. 
Birds did eat out of the baskets on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. And you know they probably leaned forward and three baskets are three days. Good, so far so good. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang you on a tree and the birds shall eat your flesh from off of you. Wow, what was the reaction to that? I wonder if the butler's like, <laughs> you know, moving away. <laughs> you stay over there. Interesting, he's the one who's most hesitant to tell his dream. The other guy had no problem piping up and telling him. He's the one that appears to be guilty. But let's see what happens. Well, it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the head of the chief baker among his servants. By the way, again, Potiphar may well have been the one to commit or to conduct this investigation. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And there would be rejoicing, and then, you know, obviously you welcome him back. But as he would turn to this baker and pronounce him guilty in a death sentence, he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. You know, I mean, he had lots of emails to respond to, a lot of things to catch up on. He was busy. He forgot him. What do you think Joseph was doing every day? He got news. Hey, did you hear the butler, man? He's, he's back, he's serving again. But then the baker, he got, and they hung him. Every time anybody officially connected with Pharaoh's court would come down to that political prison house, you can bet Joseph was like, oh. anybody here remember being a little kid and you're having like lunch or peanut butter and jelly and your mom gets off the phone to say, you know, Billy or whatever your friend is going to come over later and he's like two o'clock. What do you do? You wolf down your sandwich and you go stand in the driveway <laughs> and you wait for two hours, right? Anybody ever been there? Anybody felt that pain? No? And some, you know, Billy's sister came home with the measles or something and so he can't come over. And so your mom's in the, and she's taking the long walk down the driveway to let you know your friends aren't coming. And it's like 3.30 now. Remember that feeling? Try having done nothing wrong. You've interpreted a dream and this guy forgot all about you. Every time someone would get, he'd be like, huh? Do you know how long he has to wait? Two years. It says two full years. Proverbs says it this way. Maybe you can understand this proverb. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Does that ring a bell? But when desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Came to pass at the end of two full years, chapter 41, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in the meadow. Behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kine did eat up the seven well-favored. I wonder if that was like graphic. Like, mm -hmm, you know, and just, ah! And so Pharaoh awoke. And he slept and he dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wing wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the rank, seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. It was so intense. He sat up going, ha! Ah! Oh, wow, behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. Yeah. And he sent and he called for all the magicians. These are, we'll, we'll get into this, but of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, Oh, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me inward in the captain of the guard's house. That'd be Potiphar's. Both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, and I and he, and we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was with us a young man, a Hebrew. 
servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him. And he interpreted to us our dreams to each man according to his dream. He did interpret. And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself, which would help us to understand it's not a Hyksos king if you're following your Egyptian history. And he changed his raiment and he came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst interpret a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it's not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said, we're out of time. Come back next week. <laughs> Sorry, we, kids have to get picked up. Let's stand, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we settle our hearts before you. Lord, for those who know you, in fact, Lord, for those wives in the room this morning whose hope has been deferred, hoping that their husbands would truly be on fire for Jesus, and that it would show up in how the house is managed and how they're treated. And Lord, encourage them. You know, you've heard these things, and you will bring it to pass. Lord, for the husbands in this room who are praying for their wives, Lord, to come to know you, change those things that are difficult. Help them to be encouraged, you know. For those parents this morning in the room whose children are breaking their hearts because they've turned from the truth, and they're walking in the flesh, and they wonder if you understand. Give them your encouragement, Lord. You will take care of these things in your timing. And lastly, Lord, for anyone here that doesn't know you, wondering, could God ever love me? With all the mess that I've made of my life, all the things that I've done wrong, how many times I've used his name in vain, could God still love me and accept me as a child and forgive me my sins? And the Bible is clear that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess him with your mouth as your Lord and as your Savior, asking him into your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. Thank you, Lord. You pull us out of the bondage of our sin and you set us free in Christ. Go with your people this week, Lord. Strengthen them from the word. Minister to them at home as they read for themselves. In Jesus' name, amen.